Welcome to Mayflower Church, where we believe no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. It is the Sunday that the church celebrates the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. It's a big day if you're a Lutheran, big day. They've been getting ready for this for 500 years. <laughs> we sometimes don't know what to pray for these days. The children of Puerto Rico, the children of Oklahoma's public schools, or the children of those addicted to painkillers? Or do we pray for our lawmakers who don't seem to know what a public servant does or whose children he represents? Or do we pray for journalists dying around the world trying to tell the truth? Or do we pray for the earth struggling to recover from the abuse of its inhabitants? Or do we pray for parents not sure that their kids will do better than they did? Or do we pray for soldiers sent on missions they do not understand to die in places where they may not belong? Or do we pray for women who will no longer remain silent in a world that patronizes and abuses them? Or do we pray for men who seem lost in what it means to be a man? Or do we pray for the church and the lost meaning of faith, virtue, and honesty? Or do we pray for our loved ones, lest we forget how to love them? Or do we pray for teachers, lest they wake one morning, decide to call in sick, and never go back? Or do we pray for ourselves and for all those whose job it is to pray for others so they'll hear the words they need to say? Answer us, Holy One. And we apologize for such a long list, but we were just getting started. Perhaps you will tell us all of the above and one more, to be the prayers we make, to be the answers we seek to be the people who will give others hope, lest we give up on praying altogether. It's no time for that. Amen. The text this morning is from Matthew's Gospel, 22nd chapter, verses 34 to 40. This is the greatest commandment. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Here ends this reading inspired by God. May God grant to us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Tuesday marks the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Great Reformation. We usually tell the story of how it all started by imitating the loud bang of Martin Luther's hammer nailing his 95 theses to the door of Castle Church of Wittenberg. We know, of course, that Martin Luther was not solely responsible for the Reformation. Like many others, he was responding to pressures that had been building around the then long-standing form of Christianity. He asked questions others were also asking, like, is the Pope the head of the church? Or is Jesus Christ the head of the church? Why should scripture only be read and interpreted by a small exclusive group instead of all the people? And who gave the church permission to sell indulgences and promise reduced suffering in the afterlife, all in order to pay for its foreign wars and lavish cathedrals? We talk about these challenges to church doctrine and practice by telling the story of the hammering of the 95 theses to the church door. 
That story, though, is much like the story that Mary rode into Bethlehem on a donkey. There's no donkey. We made it up. The text doesn't say anything about a donkey. This doesn't mean Mary didn't make it to Bethlehem, just that she may not have ridden on a donkey. So it is with the Reformation. Joan Acasella reminds us, scholars mostly agree that the hammering episode, so satisfying symbolically, never actually happened. Not only were there no eyewitnesses, Luther himself, ordinarily an enthusiastic self-dramatizer, was vague on what happened. He remembered drawing up a list of 95 theses around the date in question, but as for what he did with it, all he was sure of was that he sent it to the local archbishop. If the 95 theses sprouted a myth, that is no surprise. Luther was one of those figures who touched off something much larger than himself, namely the sundering of the church and a fundamental revision of its theology. Once he had divided the church, it could not be healed, and he had no idea what his reforms meant for the rest of Christendom. Luther's reforms survived to breed other reforms, many of which Luther himself would have disproved of. For example, in his essay on the councils and the church, Luther set out seven external marks of the church, the fifth of which is that the church consecrates or calls ministers, but added the clarification that the Holy Ghost has accepted women, children, and incompetent people from this function, but chooses, except in emergencies, only competent men to fill this office. So obviously the best way for us to celebrate the Reformation is for a woman to stand in the pulpit. <laughs> this would give a Luther a heart attack. Well deserved. The Great Reformation is part of what Anglican Bishop Mark Dyer has described as the once in every 500 years church rummage sale. That is, every 500 years, the empowered structures of institutionalized Christianity become intolerable and must be shattered in order for renewal and growth to occur. In Oklahoma vernacular, it's a garage sale. We drag everything out of the church attic onto the front lawn and get rid of what we no longer need or what no longer works in order to make room for newness, leaving only that which has deep meaning or at least that's how it's supposed to work. Phyllis Tickle expanded on Reverend Dyer's work, giving a more in-depth explanation of the once every 500 year church rummage sale. 500 years back from today takes us to the Reformation, the result of which was Protestant Christianity in all its complexity, including its divisiveness and its gifts of rationalism and enlightenment. That rummage sale helped us give the heave ho to indulgences, out too went illiteracy, and out went celibacy for priests, at least those who became Protestants. 500 years before the Great Reformation takes us to the Great Schism, when Rome excommunicated Constantinople, and Constantinople returned the favor. The fight was over quite a few issues, including whose mother tongue was to be used in worship, and about whether or not yeast should be incorporated in consecrated bread, that rummage sale resulted in a split as well, but it allowed more people greater religious expression. Greek and or Eastern Orthodoxy would be the faith of the Eastern world, and Roman Catholicism would be the dominant expression of Christianity in the West. 500 years prior to the Great Schism takes us to the sixth century and to Gregory the Great. Gregory the Great, or Saint Gregory the First in the Roman tradition, who did not lead a revolution so much as he cleaned one up. Popular recognition of Gregory's greatness rests upon his having led a continent that was in total upheaval into some kind of ecclesio-political coherence. The two basic issues that had been threatening to break the church apart were the questions of whether or not Mary could be called mother of God and whether or not Jesus was one person of two natures or two persons inside one skin. Like yeast in communion bread, 
it's a bit hard for us to appreciate the seriousness of their arguments, but imagine us telling our ancestors that congregations would split over the color of the carpet. At least their arguments were theological. 500 years before Gregory the Great takes us to the first century and to you know who, Jesus. Of course, Jesus was not, was not a Christian, he was Jewish, but it stands to reason that we have church rummage sales so regularly because our teacher was reforming his own tradition. The scripture we read today is part of a series of religious tests by the Sadducees and Pharisees Time and time again, Jesus answers in ways that expand what is considered right belief and ties it to right practice for good measure. Which commandment in the law is the greatest? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This was a bit different than what the Sadducees and Pharisees had been teaching. The Sadducees and Pharisees being those that the Gospels use as a stand-in for anyone trying to reduce faithfulness to legalism. For a very long time, people have been trying to turn faithfulness and spirituality into a checklist. But Jesus would have none of it. Love God and love neighbor, on those two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The rest of Jesus' teaching and ministry was the fulfillment of the law in the spirit of the prophets. The double commandment of love, love your neighbor and love God, is a summary of Jesus' salvific work. Jesus was managing a rummage sale of his tradition out with the checklists, the long prayers, and showy religious devotion. But, but keep the love, keep the love, the foundation of, of those things. Given his faithfulness unto death on a cross, Jesus reminds us that the kind of love he meant was not warm affection, but unwavering, stubborn commitment. To love thy neighbor is to take their needs seriously and this is how to measure faithfulness. It is not surprising that Jesus was conducting this rummage sale. Jewish scholars and rabbis have noted the same sort of once every 500 year cycles in Judaism. If one goes back 500 years from the destruction of the second temple and priestly Judaism in the first century around the time of Jesus, one hits the Babylonian captivity which decimated Solomon's temple and scattered Judaism away from Judea and into much of the Middle Eastern world. They would have to figure out how to practice their faith in new ways. 500 years before the captivity was the end of the age of the judges and the establishment of the monarchy, King David being the most familiar to us. It could be argued that what we have in our cycling ways is not so much a Christian phenomenon as it is Judeo-Christian one, and it may be even larger than that. Of late, multiple Islamic scholars have begun to argue that the same kind of cycling can be discerned in that faith's history too. And this too should not surprise us, since organized religion in its public role is the soul of a culture. These once every 500 year church rummage sales are inextricably connected to a generalized social, political, economic, intellectual, and cultural shift. In each of our 500-year cycles, more than religion has been in turmoil. This, of course, is because organized religion is a social construct, an assertion so flatly stated it is often offensive to many people of faith. But it doesn't make it less true. Religion is a social construct as well as an individual way of being and understanding. While the 500th anniversary of the Reformation is an indicator that the church is due for another revolution, all we really needed to check were the newspaper headlines. Our rummage sale is racial and around gender and built around identity. Will we get rid of intellectualism or anti-intellectualism? 
We are discerning freedom of movement, which people are allowed to decide where to raise their families. We see it in immigration, refugee, and asylum arguments. And we are redefining the separation of church and state. If Congress gives the green light for churches to become campaign headquarters by allowing them to endorse candidates, we will see sanctuary after sanctuary sold to the highest bidder. And given the current situation in Oklahoma, it leads one to wonder, which pulpits will big oil buy? That's a real threat in Oklahoma, asked the Speaker of the House. The rummage sale has already begun. The church has been forced to respond to declining membership and accusations of irrelevancy. The church is finally catching on to the fact that it cannot survive on damnation, preachers saddling the faithful with a theology of fear, fear of believing the wrong thing, fear of Muslims, fear of atheists, fear of beer and smoking and voting Democrat, fear of other faith, fear of losing our privilege, fear of asking questions, fear of uncertainty, fear of an angry, vengeful God. Those who preach such messages seem to be especially loud these days, and particularly vile. But this is often what happens right before we see major change. The darkest hour is just before the dawn. I really do believe that. And, and I'm looking at some other people who believe that too, people who know that serving meals at the Homeless Alliance is real communion. People who are welcoming new members into this family today, expecting the newbies to shake things up and get us out of our old ways of thinking and doing. People who love God and neighbor in ways that commit them to show up for justice reform, immigration reform, and general heart and mind reform. The church, for all its rummage sales, for all its reorganizing and rearranging, has always managed to hold on to a most precious heirloom, the one Jesus lifted up in the double commandment, and that is love. It's been stuffed way back in the attic a few times, pushed aside, covered by blankets of right belief and legalism, and, and almost forgotten about. But a faithful someone has always managed to find love dust it off, and then set the table with it. So let's get to it, church. Our reformation has just begun.